stage is yours. OK, thank you. Wait, now I have to click away the fact that you are started recording and I have to click this away and now I can actually talk. So I'm guessing you can all see my screen, right? That's working out. OK, yes. it's a little bit weird, my setup now, because I can only see uh, my slides on this screen and I'm talking to you uh, on this other screen. So just so if you see me flicking backwards and forwards, uh, that's why it is, why that is. Um, OK, so thank you for having me, right? Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy uh, to be here. And uh, basically uh, what I want to talk about is a little bit about how humans and intelligent technology interact uh, on various uh, levels. The reason I want to talk about that is uh, when I was asked uh, to give uh, this presentation, right, uh, Maria Lucic uh, said that she mentioned these two things uh, that she knows of my work that she thought might be interesting to talk about. Uh, one is called Dreams for Cars. That's a, a European funded project. It has recently finished and it's basically about uh, control of autonomous vehicles uh, where we've basically built a slightly biologically inspired uh, controller. Uh, for the autonomous vehicle. The other one was a paper that was presented at the Roma conference uh, this year, uh, which is much more high level, much more philosophical, and basically talks about what the human robot interaction, the field, uh, can learn from what human animal interaction, the field, uh, has done in the past. So I was kind of scratching my head for like five minutes on how can you possibly combine human animal interaction with autonomous vehicle control uh, and the presentation today is the result uh, of that uh, uh, deliberation uh, deliberation. So the commonality is of course that there are humans involved uh, everywhere autonomous vehicles interact. Uh, with the hum humans, but also the kind of controller that we built in this project was inspired uh, by human uh, control. And uh, in human robot interaction, human animal interaction, of course, human is clear. It's clear that that term exists. So the take home message, right? Because I also don't know how much time I will really have. And also I don't have a clock on my screen anymore. I don't know why that disappeared, uh, but uh, in case I don't run, I run out of time. This is the take home message. You cannot ignore humans uh, when you're building an intelligent uh, system. And the reason is the uh, your systems that you build have to interact with humans uh, one way or the other. Right? This is certainly uh, true uh, very often, even if we build an autonomous system, an autonomous vehicle exists on the on the road in a physical world where other vehicles are driven by humans. Even if no other vehicles are driven by humans, there are pedestrians, uh, bicyclists uh, and so on, vulnerable road users. And even if they all go away, there are still people inside the vehicle. So you're always uh, interacting with uh, humans and that's uh, you cannot forget about that part. To some degree, it's even true um, if the robots are in deep space. Uh, so I primarily have this slide because uh, Janet Vertesi gave a nice keynote lecture at HRI, the conference, a couple of uh, years ago. Uh, and she has this very nice book uh, which describes basically how the team at NASA that controls the Mars rover works, right? And how, so how much of the schedule of the team and the um, uh, uh, the direction of what was I going to say? The uh, interaction of the team with the rover and the rover's behavior. It all depends on how these two, uh, how they co interact. It's certainly not the case that uh, having the robot just uh, on Mars means there is no human robot interaction anymore. There is an entire team uh, on uh, Earth living to Martian uh, times. Uh, uh, what's the word for that? Uh, the rhythms, day rhythms, circadian rhythms to the Martian uh, circadian rhythms just so they can control uh, the robot. And uh, the dynamics that uh, uh, emerge from that, of course, make an entire book, uh, which is why I have this little slide here. So if you look at HRI, I think uh, this is obviously uh, to some degree uh, at the minimum implicit. Uh, in most of uh, what people do, right? It's for a very long time. People have, uh, starting all the way back in 1978, people have started thinking about like what kind of different robots uh, can we build uh, and uh, how does the interaction between the human and the robot uh, then evolve, right? And what is the role of the human uh, in those, uh, uh, what is the role of the robot in these various uh, interactions and how does that shape the kind of robots that you will build. So it's not necessarily uh, particularly 
uh, new um, idea. But uh, when you get to the more machine learning uh, fields these days, uh, sometimes uh, it gets lost a little bit that the algorithms uh, that we build are there uh, to interact uh, or to function in a world that is still uh, fundamentally a human world. Mm. I have like some things in the chat. Uh, right, there we go. The challenge is, of course, how to facilitate suitable interaction. Indeed, I fully agree uh, with that. OK, so what I want to talk about here then is that there are like different ways in which humans can matter. And it's maybe worth uh, going through a couple of examples of each just to get a feel uh, for why it doesn't make much sense uh, to develop an algorithm for a real world application without also considering that it's going to be used uh, by a human. Uh, at some point in time. Uh, and I'm going to just move this here so I actually have some control over the time. So there are four, uh, three main points, and they kind of break into a couple of sub points sometimes. Just having a human present can change the dynamics of your system, and just having an artificial system present can change the dynamics of the human. Uh, very often they define basically how a system will actually work. Either they're an inspiration for algorithms, or uh, they cut off they can't start becoming a kind of success criteria in the sense that your system that you build is only good if your end users are happy with it. Uh, and they're certainly going to have a lot of opinions, right? So you might have some idea on how to build a robot uh, that will uh, support uh, uh, the humans in a specific situation, like in care homes and so on. Uh, but uh, the end users might have a very different idea. Uh, of uh, what would be a suitable robot. And all of these are things uh, we cannot just uh, ignore. So to talk about them a little bit, right? The first one, the presence might change the dynamics of your system. Uh, this is going to be a relatively high level, um, but it's something that I really think should be obvious, right? You can build a fantastic algorithm, uh, and it should be obvious that as soon as you expose it to humans, the things are going to go in a direction that you did not necessarily anticipate. But apparently, uh, it is not always that obvious, because in 2016, if you remember, Microsoft uh, decided it was a good idea to release uh, a type of chatbot uh, on Twitter that was going to learn from uh, the interactions it has with people on Twitter, and it became a very unpleasant, very racist, uh, racist misogynist um, bot in less than 24 hours. So I, to the degree that I couldn't actually find any funny uh, examples of the tweets that it was first viewing out at the end of it. Everything I found uh, was actually really rather uh, offensive. And of course, to some degree, this is simply because it started learning from real humans and humans, especially a particular subgroup on 4chan, decided to have some fun uh, with uh, the learning abilities of this bot. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, the system started build, uh, doing something that none of its developers ever intended. And this can happen over and over and over again, right? So one simple way in which humans matter. Um, I have a bunch of videos that I'm not actually going to show in the talk uh, simply because uh, um, I'm not sure how good the uh, transmission rate uh, on this call uh, is going to be. Uh, but if you go to YouTube, you can find this uh, fantastic little spoofs uh, from a, a team called Boss Town. So you can see that it's not Boston, but Boss Town uh, Dynamics. Uh, and they basically have this spoof of Boston Dynamics uh, robot videos where the robot uh, gets increasingly annoyed uh, with its humans and increasingly starts punishing them for uh, punishing it. And that's obviously an interesting uh, aspect again, right? If we build robots that are going to learn from experience, from interaction with humans, then we need to understand in what kind of direction uh, this robot is going uh, to develop. Uh, it's certainly not the case that it will necessarily keep doing everything that the designer intended. So the designer has to keep in mind that this is going to be released uh, to people that are just going to use hockey sticks and push the uh, robot around just to see what it does. If the robot then learns from this, unintended consequences might happen. Happen. Right. Um, if you then take a step back and you go to uh, like social cognitive science, uh, you find a few people who are very interested in what actually makes uh, social cognition. And it's an interesting subfield 
because uh, for a very long time, uh, people in social cognition still tended to treat uh, social cognition, the mechanisms, as something that exists fundamentally inside your skull. So the problem in social cognition traditionally was simply what kind of mechanisms do you as an individual need uh, in order to interact uh, with another individual. Um, and then more recently um, in like uh, subfields uh, called inactivism, uh, and a bunch of related fields, uh, people started asking, uh, what if this um, interaction itself is also constitutive uh, of uh, cognition? So that you cannot actually just focus uh, on the uh, mechanisms that an uh, agent has uh, individually inside whatever it is, it's exclosure, it's skull, it's robot brain, uh, whatever, but what if the fact that it interacts with another agent matters and what if the interaction itself is also a constitutive element in social cognition. So there, um, the paper that I have here is from 2010. I like it a lot, so I recommend it uh, from Hannah de Jäger. Uh, it basically uh, gives you an explanation that you cannot think of a cognitive mechanism just as um, something that happens inside one individual. The fact that it, uh, we interact with other individuals is important in understanding human cognition and the interaction itself uh, is also uh, important in understanding the overall um, uh, while interaction and dynamics and cognitive mechanisms that emerge. Um, if you have never heard of an activism, uh, I'm going to oversimplify it. So if you have heard of it, then you will probably hate me right now. But if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's basically this idea that what's fundamental is that uh, uh, cognition in agents, we have dynamical systems that are agents and they are interacting with the world. And we understand uh, these agents fundamentally through the mathematical language of dynamical systems. And what makes an agent a cognitive agent is that it tries to maintain its own internal dynamics in the face of perturbation uh, from the environment. So you get this kind of graph. Uh, I don't actually know if you can see my pointer. I hope you can see my pointer, but if not, uh, then you see these two circles circles um, that exist and they have this internal horizontal circle. They, this is sort of meant to represent the internal dynamics uh, of the system. Uh, and this is what we uh, try to maintain, right? If this goes away, uh, then uh, you stop existing as an agent. You also have uh, dynamics that uh, define how you interact with the world, and then you have perturbations uh, from the environment, including from other agents. So it begins, uh, it's beginning to be relatively easy to see how uh, all these interactions are going to matter uh, for the, uh, the internal dynamics because they all uh, co-determine uh, this dynamic. So that's uh, the one slide uh, summary uh, of uh, what an activism is very much in an oversimplified uh, manner. Um, there are people uh, who are interested then in how multiple agents interact. And here's Tom Fröse. He's done an interesting paper a while ago, and I think they're still uh, working uh, on this. Uh, where they've created a little arena in simulation and two very simple robots, and they are the simplest uh, possible robots uh, that you can imagine. So they're each driven uh, with just one neuron. Uh, and this is uh, interesting because that also makes it the simplest dynamical system you can Im uh, imagine. It becomes a one-dimensional uh, dynamical system, uh, and they start uh, letting these agents run about, and they look at what happens in the state space uh, of the two agents or the fair uh, of their dynamical systems, the one dimensional dynamical systems that control these two agents. Uh, and they see uh, these kind of um, oscillatory uh, behaviors uh, appearing. And this is interesting uh, if you're into dynamical systems because a one dimensional dynamical system shouldn't really be giving you any oscillations, right? These things uh, go towards uh, fixed point attractors. They either go to a stable value uh, or they uh, dec uh, decay. Uh, to a different uh, or to zero. Uh, so the fact that these kind of dynamics go uh, shows that you could not understand one uh, particular agent just from those uh, from the dynamics that you would expect from one neuron if you studied it in isolation. In addition, um, it's 
where it's possible to um, estimate like the dimensionality of the system that you're observing. Uh, and they also did that and they find that uh, the system that they are looking at looks like it's a three dimensional uh, system uh, most likely. And that's also interesting. So you cannot explain the dynamics that you observe um, entirely just from the fact that you have two agents that are interacting because that would be a two dimensional system then. So this seems to uh, suggest at least that uh, when I have two uh, agents with one neuron each interacting, uh, the resulting behavior can only be understood if I consider it in at least three dimensions. So I guess what the two agents are doing and something that the interaction is doing. Just to give this uh, general message that uh, interaction between agents is going to be useful and important. And when we design uh, algorithms, uh, we should probably keep that in mind. Right. So your system might also change the, uh, the way that humans behave. So we already got this idea that we have this kind of feedback loop there. Um, again, I'm not going to show this video, but if you're, you've probably seen it before. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, uh, this is one of the reasons I love YouTube, because people do all sorts of stupid things and they put that on YouTube for the world to see. In this particular case, uh, these people uh, decided that they were going to this, uh, uh, try out the pedestrian detection system uh, of the Volvo XC60 uh, uh, that they have there. So the idea behind the uh, pedestrian detection system is that if it detects a pedestrian, it will go and uh, break uh, the car. So you don't actually run the car over, uh, the pedestrian over. If you look at the video, you will notice that they will run over the poor fella in the uh, pink shirt here um, because they just accelerate at uh, this person. Uh, the reason that happens uh, is for two reasons. Uh, the first reason was that this particular Volvo that they had um, the pedestrian detection system was an optional extra. It did not actually exist in the vehicle that they purchased. It wasn't built in, so it wouldn't have done anything. Uh, and the second reason is that the way it works uh, in this particular car is if you're flooring it, uh, then the vehicle thinks you're in control, uh, full control of whatever it, whatever it is that you're doing, so it will not interfere. Right. So even if they had had the pedestrian detection system, they would still have run over the person uh, because it would not have engaged in the situation that they have used it. So this is important because it shows you that how people are going to use the systems that you build doesn't depend necessarily on how you've designed the system, uh, but it depends uh, on uh, how people think uh, that that system uh, is actually going uh, to work. Right. And that uh, we take into account and we've done like a bunch of little, um, I mean, uh, this has been studied by a lot of people, right? Humans will always adapt uh, to other agents and the abilities that they think the other agent has, not necessarily the ability that the agent uh, actually has. Uh, this is true uh, for humans interacting with other humans, right? You interact differently uh, with a five-year-old child than you do uh, with an 18-year-old uh, teenager than you do with a 60-year-old. Um, it extends to artificial agents. People have studied this in robotics for quite a while now. Uh, you can, for instance, manipulate like how uh, fluent in English a robot is, and humans will adapt uh, their language in the kind of uh, behaviors uh, in how they give commands uh, to the robot. Have a robot that speaks perfectly natural English, and people will converse in natural English. Have a robot that speaks more machine-like, and people will go more to like keyword command type uh, interactions. And we've also seen this when people uh, interact uh, with intelligent vehicles. So we did a bunch of things just in simulation. Um, this is an old uh, example, but I want to talk about it a little bit anyway, because it's interesting. Um, where we try to manipulate how people, how intelligent an autonomous vehicle or an uh, intelligent adaptive system inside a vehicle appeared to the participants that we had. So participants got a little navigation task uh, where they had to navigate this kind of uh, weird map that you see on the top. Uh, the reason it looks so weird is because we tried to avoid 90 degree corners. We talked, uh, we built, we did this in collaboration with Volvo. Uh, and one of the things that Volvo told us at the beginning is that if you have like more than two or three 90 degree corners in a simulation, people are going to get uh, simulator sickness and then uh, they'll be in a corner vomiting rather than doing uh, your experiment. So you should have as gentle um, corners uh, as you can have. Uh, so we tried to build this kind of map. And all they have to do is navigate to one of the two uh, goal uh, locations, which are these squares that we have at the very right. 
Uh, and the way they can uh, do this is either just with a paper map uh, or by having like a glorified GPS that points them towards different directions uh, at each location uh, uh, whenever they get uh, to a junction. Um, and when uh, that happens, it can either just show you an arrow that goes like go left, go right, or, or it can show you an arrow and give you a reason why you should do that. The other thing we manipulated there was simply how much traffic there was on the various uh, uh, on the various routes that uh, they could take. And you can also see that when they see a juncture, they can see both versions. Uh, so you can do things like uh, say that they should go left because there is less traffic on that route and then drive them right into a traffic jam, uh, which then makes it seem like it wasn't a very good idea uh, to go that way. So you can manipulate like how clever the system worked basically by combining how much information uh, the system gives to the users and uh, how it describes the situation and how these things that actually match uh, with reality. So I don't want to talk in detail about everything we did in this study, uh, but that's the basic idea, right? You find uh, people who rate um, uh, these uh, vehicles more or less intelligent while they do this interaction task. A little funny side thing is that there are extremely easy navigation strategies for this environment, even though it looks kind of messy. Uh, you could, for instance, just decide that you go left uh, until you get to junction 18 and then you go right. So there's nothing particularly cognitively demanding in figuring out a way to navigate uh, this thing. But people will still follow uh, whatever the system says uh, they should do. And one of the funky things we saw uh, is that depending on how intelligent people thought uh, the system was, uh, they spent less and less time just staring straight out uh, of the front screen uh, of the vehicle. Uh, and they did, or maybe a more accurate way uh, to describe that is that the more stupid they thought that the system was, the more they spent staring uh, straight ahead. Uh, and uh, they did that to a degree uh, where um, it's no longer uh, equivalent or it's no longer what we do when we normally drive vehicles. So it's not the case with that when you drive a vehicle, you spend 100% of your time uh, staring out of the front of your windscreen because you're obviously paying attention uh, to your surroundings uh, as well. So what people normally do is about like 80, 75% of the time staring ahead. Uh, the rest is checking out uh, your surroundings. People who do like 95% staring ahead, they are people who are on the mobile phone uh, and they have stopped engaging with what's actually really happening uh, around them. So this is just an interesting thing, right? The behavior of uh, the participants in this study, like something that you don't necessarily think should be affected, namely just like how much do they stare uh, to the front of the windscreen was affected simply by how intelligent this uh, system uh, seemed to them. This was a small study with only 30 participants, so uh, uh, there are plenty of question marks we can have on how strong these results are. So we did a similar thing, this time with 130 or 120, I don't remember, uh, participants. And uh, this was funded by the Swedish uh, Energy uh, Foundation, I think, uh, or yeah, Energy um, administration, so they're people who like uh, to find uh, ways of reducing uh, energy consumption on the planet. So we looked at whether or not people, people's eco-friendly driving behavior could be influenced uh, in that way as well. So depending on what kind of suggestions the system gives uh, in the exact same task, do people drive more or less economically friendly? And what we had in this case is that we have uh, a system that either doesn't give them any eco friendly driving recommendations at all, uh, or it gives them driving recommendations like um, using simple icons, you know, lift the foot of the gar of your gas and start coasting, uh, or change gears up, change gears down. Or we had like the more intelligent version is what we called it, where in addition to suggesting that you should start coasting or you should shift gear, it would give you a reason why you should do that. Now, the reason this is a two by three design is because we had the same uh, GPS uh, type in there as well. So it would also navigate uh, you to a goal, either just using arrows or giving you a reason uh, why you should um, go a certain direction. And the long story short is uh, that this matters. Uh, so on the same task in the same environment, uh, if you give them eco driving um, directions, okay, so some recommendations, of course, they will start. Um, um, use, they will start following them and they will use uh, less petrol. Uh, but if you give them reasons why they should do something, uh, then they will um, uh, save even more 
um, Petrov. So the uh, kind of uh, energy consumption went uh, down consistently, except uh, for this kind of group that I have here that I will talk about uh, in a second. But give them a basic eco drive system and we reduce uh, fuel consumption a little bit. This is basically liters per 100 kilometers. Give them an informative one, then we reduce uh, eco uh, fuel consumption by a lot. Uh, and a similar thing happens when you look at when people start shifting gear, right? G tell them to shift gears and they shift start shifting gears a little bit earlier. Tell them to shift gears and tell them why they should do that. They will start shifting gears even earlier, except uh, for this group here. And what is interesting about this group is that it gets a GPS, uh, which tells uh, people why they should go left or right at a crossing, but it gets an eco driving system that just gives them instructions without justifying them. And then it seems that those people in that particular case, they stop stopped listening to the eco driving system entirely. This was a bit surprising to us when we uh, did this. Uh, our best hypothesis uh, is that uh, this happens because people don't perceive these two things as separate systems. They perceive one holistic system that supports them in their driving task. Uh, and if the uh, navigation part of the system does a fantastic job, then it just makes the uh, eco driving recommendation part of the system just look a little bit stupid. And then they're less likely uh, to follow that uh, recommendation, but that's a hypothesis. We haven't really been able uh, to uh, figure out how to test that exactly. This is uh, very much uh, something for future work. This was published, I think, in 2018, so still relatively recent. The reason we looked at both like fuel consumption and uh, behavioral cues, so when do people change uh, gear, and also how much of the time do they actually spend uh, coasting, uh, is because fuel consumption you can fake and manipulate as much as you want uh, just by uh, messing with the fuel consumption model that you have uh, in your simulation right these are very complicated models with lots of parameters if you wanted to drive a particular point home you can easily do that it's a little bit harder to mess with uh, the behavioral cues uh, that people will give so i think these are a little bit more informative than just looking at the fuel consumption but okay so just a couple of um, examples where how the system is designed is going to change how does how humans uh, behave uh, when they interact with the system and then the same way if you know imagine the full um, circle uh, how humans behave would then again affect how the systems might uh, uh, behave we get this kind of uh, feedback loop uh, going on there uh, this is a little side study. This was also interesting. It shows the same point uh, again. Uh, this was done by other people, but also at the University of Schöfte in Sweden. Uh, and they had an autonomous system, uh, again simulated, uh, where it was literally an autonomous car, this case. So people just got into the simulator and then they had a newspaper, they had snacks, they could nibble, they could do whatever, they could play on the phone, uh, no restrictions, and the car would just go and drive along. And while it was driving, uh, weather conditions started deteriorating. So at some point, uh, the vehicle asks uh, the human in the, in the driver's seat to take over control. In autonomous vehicle research, this is one of the interesting questions, right? How do you get a human who's been doing literally whatever uh, to being in control of the vehicle within a short amount of time, while also understanding what it was exactly that caused the uh, uh, the problem uh, that caused the, um, uh, the, um, the vehicle to relinquish uh, control. And they had two conditions. One condition basically just had this drive and then eventually people had to take over. And the second condition, uh, people additionally had this little display uh, here on the left. And they were told uh, just that this uh, indicates the confidence of the vehicle in continuing to drive uh, autonomously, nothing else. That was the only information that they had. So what they found initially, uh, the two things that you would expect, right? If you give people this kind of additional information, they are capable of taking control faster than if it is not there. Um, and they will also look around and do other things more uh, than uh, people who don't have this uh, information and they start, uh, well, they start monitoring what the system does a little bit more overall. But the interesting result was that if you give them this additional information, you would think that it makes it more transparent uh, what the system actually does, uh, and it probably does, but people trusted this system less uh, than people in a condition that did not have this interesting uh, uh, additional information. So that's also an interesting result. And the hypothesis why this is happening is because um, 
is that it's not really a case of trusting a system less than in the control condition, but that the people in the control condition, uh, they actually start to trusting the system too much, right? So that this is a way of ensuring that people understand what the actual abilities uh, of the system are, and that then ensures that they show appropriate levels of trust, uh, and they also start um, app showing appropriate uh, behaviors uh, when this drops. Um, how do you measure trust? In this case, this was a simple questionnaire, like five uh, item Likert scale, uh, I think. Uh, so in general, I don't want to talk about trust uh, too much because trust is obviously a huge uh, Pandora's box and a can of worms. If you start going there, you never get out. Um, but it is an interesting thing, right? That if you ask them objectively, how much did you trust the system, then you end up with this difference uh, between the groups and you end up with behaviors that is more appropriate in one group uh, than in another. Uh, and uh, it's all to do with like transparency, to what degree do people understand what the system is doing uh, and uh, to what degree um, does that help them build a complete understanding of the system. Right, so this was quite a while ago, right? This was already eight years ago. This was a little bit before uh, people started really talking uh, about uh, explainable artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, but uh, before explainable artificial in intelligence turned up, we had this entire subfield of situation awareness and system awareness, uh, where we thought about how does a system really explain what is necessary to a human operator so that they can take appropriate decisions in time. And you can see how this sort of feeds back to well, what is now XAI. And if I have enough time, I will actually get back to explainable AI uh, at the end of this talk, but I already wanted to drop it in here because just to say that XAI is not a new thing. It's basically been built up on like decades of human uh, interaction with uh, machine systems, especially in decision support tasks and so on. Okay, so that was the first point. Second point, so they define how your system works, right? So this is also a little bit uh, my attempt to, to bridge the two very different things uh, that we were interested in. So let's talk a little about that. I'm going to talk a bit, little bit less explicitly about human cognition as an inspiration for algorithms, because literally all of cognitive robotics tends to do that. And even deep learning algorithms were originally inspired by uh, things that we find in neuroscience. So I think we all know plenty of examples of this case, but they're also part uh, of your success criteria. I think that's a little bit more interesting in this context of the, this talk. So. Um, this is then the story of that paper. I just want to plug that a little bit and sell it to you. Uh, when you have humans and you design, uh, use humans as an inspiration for a system, you have these two different ways in which you can use uh, humans, right? They can be a target, uh, in which case they are simply defining what you want uh, the system uh, to do, uh, and they can be a benchmark, right? So they can be something that you evaluate um, your system against, uh, either like by comparing uh, artificial systems behavior to human behavior, uh, or um, basically by looking at how the human and the system interacts and whether or not this goes according to what you have. So sometimes it's a human ability that becomes the benchmark. Sometimes it's how the human interacts with the system that becomes the benchmark. And when how the human interacts with the system becomes a benchmark, you very often have ideas uh, from previous fields. Like you might have looked at social cognition beforehand and have uh, come up with ideas of how humans interact with other humans, and you want that interaction to be replicated. But you can also have looked at how humans interact with computers, and you want that to be uh, replicated with your robots. Or, and this is the story of this paper that I will not actually go into more than this slide. Uh, you can look at how humans have yeah, interacted with animals uh, and look at those uh, interactions. Human animal interaction is an interesting field uh, because animals play various roles in society that all sorts of mimics uh, the roles that uh, yeah, that uh, robots that we want robots to play, right? We use uh, animals uh, as uh, companions. So we use animals to get stuff done. Uh, in, think about farms and so on. We use animals uh, as like in therapy. If you think about animal assisted therapy for children with autism spectrum disorder and so on, that is a thing, but there is also an entire field uh, that is building robots for therapy for children with autism spectrum disorder. and. And human-animal interaction as a field, of course, has 
a huge head start on human robot interaction because animals have been around for a long time. Robots have come around relatively recently. So the fundamental story in this paper is simply it's a little bit strange that we haven't looked at it a little bit more at that field of human animal interaction because there are plenty of interesting lessons to be learned there. And that's certainly something we should explore a little bit more. So that's that. Um, I did mention uh, robots in robot assisted uh, therapy. So this is part of a project I was also involved in um, earlier. We did actually try to build robot control um, for um, yeah, robot assisted therapy uh, for children with autism spectrum disorder. And the fundamental aim of this project was simply uh, to make this robot control a little bit more autonomous. So replace uh, the wizard in a Wizard of Oz uh, paradigm. You want this robot to be able to go through um, an intervention as defined by a clinical psychologist, uh, but you want it to do so autonomously. So you need to be able to pick up on like how the robot's behaving, uh, and not the robot, sorry, the child. Like is the child doing what we would expect a child to do, and what are the appropriate uh, behaviors that uh, the robot should be doing uh, if a child does a certain thing X. Uh, the good news and the reason we should be interested, like more from a tactical point of view, the reason we should be interested in this kind of field uh, is because it is actually relatively well constrained. One of the major issues with robots is, of course, making them operate uh, in the real world. Uh, and that can be hard, but this is a very constrained world because uh, the therapy, uh, the way that the therapy goes is defined by the psychotherapist. You don't get to have any say uh, in that. Uh, and they also have very clear ideas of what they expect to see from the child at every point in time. And they also have very clear ideas of what the robot should be doing uh, based on what the child uh, is doing. So it becomes feasible uh, to build a robot that can operate somewhat autonomously uh, in this system. Obviously, Obviously, never without a therapist. Right? There's always a therapist in charge of the whole interaction and always able to override what it is, whatever it is that the robot wants to do. Just a way of removing remote control a little bit. But uh, when you're building uh, this kind of system, you also, uh, at a higher level, you realize um, that uh, the way uh, that we define uh, the success of this kind of robot isn't actually in like it can score well on an amnist data set or it can score well on this data set or it can pick a red object and put it in the blue box, right? The uh, nice criterion for success is really the interaction that uh, starts to emerge between the robot uh, and uh, the child. So if you start thinking uh, about this on more general terms, we have very often a situation where uh, we build robots. What we design is the robot behaviors, but what we evaluate is how this robot behavior uh, facilitates a certain interaction with a human that we did not design, uh, but the interaction between the robot and the human is what really, really matters there. Um, so that's what I have on this slide. I do think, uh, yeah, I probably talked about this um, already, right? The main problem that you have in those cases is that you can never fully specify uh, all the behaviors of your robot. So you get uh, what we had before with the Twitter bot uh, and the boss town dynamics fake uh, example that the robot can start doing crazy things. Uh, so you do want to constrain it. Uh, and uh, the proposal here, but again, this is a proposal. It's not something we've actually managed to implement yet. So if ever, anybody wants to work on this, I'm really, really interested. Um, is to take a sort of an activist uh, approach uh, to the system, understand that we're fundamentally building uh, dynamics uh, of a system uh, that's sort of optimized according to some objective function, but define that objective function purely uh, in terms of the quality of the interaction in a way that will actually modulate the dynamics of the system such that it becomes uh, what, it want, what we want it uh, to become. So uh, this is basically um, what we have written about, uh, again, in a paper a couple of uh, years ago. Uh, and the take home message of that is simply this kind of characterization, right? All of the cognitive science will tell you that yeah, you have basically uh, component dynamics uh, that basically determine how your system behaves and how your system interacts with the external world. But how the extra, this interaction with the external world goes that defines uh, your component dynamics. So your change um, in your internal dynamics is a function of what your current state is, uh, and basically a function of what's happening inside the outside of uh, what's happening outside uh, in the actual world. 
So the way that we can characterize interactions, and this is going to be relatively quick because uh, it takes me 20 minutes to explain it in detail, but hopefully two minutes to fly over it, um, is that we can describe like something like something like a forward model and something like an inverse model uh, that describes the expectations that we have on the interaction. So it's not literally a forward model because it's not about the agent itself, but it's basically uh, models that describe if the robot does something, then I want to see the appropriate, um, I want to see this specific response uh, from a child. And uh, the inverse like models are then if I see a specific behavior from a child, I should have done this behavior in order to elicit uh, that response uh, from the child. I can have a bunch of these uh, forward like and inverse like model to describe my interaction initially. The cool thing is that I can ask, talk to my psychotherapists uh, so they can give initial inputs into what kind of behaviors we would want, right? What should the robot have done in order to elicit a certain behavior? And what is it that a child should do when a robot does a certain behavior? And then I can start learning these things and getting better at it, maybe using reinforcement learning and so on. So in this paper, we have this full characterization of that system, but we uh, haven't actually implemented it because doing this in practice uh, using reinforcement learning uh, in an actual interaction becomes uh, really hard. And I haven't really figured out a good way of doing this in a simpler simulation yet. So if anybody has any ideas, uh, I'm very interested uh, to talk about that more. Uh, something that falls out of this a little bit when you start talking about everything in dynamical systems terms uh, is that you can start putting things in spiking neural networks, right? There are a bunch uh, of reasons why you want might want to start controlling your robot uh, using spiking neural networks. Uh, rather than traditional uh, algorithms. The simple reason is that you want to make use of uh, the benefits that neuromorphic architectures might potentially uh, give you. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you need to have a way of instantiating everything uh, that you do in uh, spiking uh, neural networks. Uh, the reason I am interested in it is because uh, it gives me an interesting uh, entry point uh, into ways of modeling cognitively more interesting uh, behaviors uh, on robot arms. Uh, uh, in, a, in a way that grounds uh, cognition in the sensory motor experience uh, of the robot. Uh, there are a couple of uh, frameworks out there. One of them is called uh, the semantic pointer architecture and uh, the neuroengineering framework, which comes with a software that's called Nango, in which you can basically design uh, spiking neural models of pretty much whatever you want um, and uh, also run that uh, on robots. So. Uh, I'm interested in building a spiking neural network uh, models of basic sensory motor cognition that operate on an actual robot. In this case, this is a simple model uh, that can do reaching uh, towards different targets in space on the robot arm, and it can adapt um, to changes in the dynamics of the robot, uh, and it can adapt uh, to locations uh, of the tar target changing location. Uh, in space, but it does all of it uh, in uh, spiking neural networks. Uh, and it can this can become a basis uh, for building a higher level cognitive um, model of uh, how you might interact in an environment. So this is really relatively brand new. This was published, um, I don't know, a couple of months ago. Uh, the, the actual proceedings are not even out yet. Uh, and uh, we have a second paper in the works uh, on this that just does a slightly more um, expansive uh, way of controlling the robot, uh, using forward models in particular uh, to predict uh, where the robot arm is going to move uh, while uh, it is moving in order to make uh, control more accurate. So there is nothing particularly new in terms of robot control here. Uh, the thing that is new is that we're doing this in spiking neural networks uh, with all the dynamics that come with the spiking neural network. So we're in a situation where, again, we don't necessarily know exactly how this robot is always going to behave, in particular if it's going to start adapting and learning uh, from a human interactor. So uh, I can no longer ignore the fact that I might be doing collaboration, collaborative tasks with uh, a human because this might eventually co-determine what my robot uh, will pick up on and learn. And if I try to figure it out just in terms of what spiking neurons are doing, that might actually become uh, a hard thing. All right, so this is basically the reference for the paper uh, just to have that there, but it's what I already mentioned. 
Um, and then I mentioned um, forward-like uh, models. How am I doing on time? I have 10 minutes or so left, I guess. I, we did start a little bit late, so hopefully I have 15 minutes. Uh, let's see. Um, every now and then uh, you start thinking about how do we need to interact with the world, and every now and then you end up with this idea uh, that you need to have a forward model, you need to have some way of predicting the outcomes of actions, um, either because you want to predict the outcomes of your own actions before you carry them out, uh, or you want to predict uh, what uh, other agents are doing while they are carrying it out, potentially so that you have a nice uh, interactive uh, dynamics uh, going on. Right, certainly in HRI, this is extremely useful uh, because you can help the robot choose um, appropriate behaviors, not just because it can predict the outcome of its actions, before it carries them out, uh, but also because it can already figure out what humans are doing and then decide uh, what it should do uh, in itself. Um, the thing is uh, that uh, you cannot always expect that you have large amounts of training data available uh, when, you, uh, when you try to train uh, these models, uh, because there are many different ways in which robots interact with robots and we're not going to collect data sets uh, that cover all of this uh, extensively. A good example uh, is autism spectrum disorder where every child is really unique, uh, but you're only going to get uh, so many uh, data points on how they behave, right? And then uh, out of there, you try to build something that as good as it can will work uh, even in cases that the system hasn't even seen before. It's really a different, completely, completely different game uh, from uh, trying to figure out what a traffic sign is by first training on, on 150 million traffic signs, right? We don't always have the luxury of uh, large data sets uh, in human robot interaction in particular. Um, so something you can do is look at uh, these kind of data sets that do exist. There's a nice one it's called uh, Pinsoro. Uh, this was pre presented a couple of uh, years ago by Severin Le Mignon and his uh, colleagues. Uh, and what they have is just a data set of children either playing with each other or playing with a robot uh, on a tablet, like a really big, massive a touch screen that is placed uh, between uh, the two agents. Uh, and we just have a bunch of videos in that data set of how these children play. Uh, so this is relatively naturalistic. They were not told to do anything in specifically. Uh, the videos are just um, collected uh, and annotated later on by human annotators on like levels of engagement and uh, whether children are playing or not engaging in play and so on. And you can obviously throw these kind of uh, uh, videos that you get out of there through um, uh, software like OpenPose uh, to go from a full scene to like the skeleton uh, of the child. And then you can ask interesting questions like if I'm interested in predicting like how engaged children are, can I figure this out? Maybe not necessarily from a full scene, but can I figure this out uh, from looking just at the kinematics uh, of how they behave? And this kind of data set uh, is useful uh, for that. But the first question that you can uh, ask before you get to the question of can a robot recognize these things is even can humans do that? So we have this uh, study here uh, where we did that. Can you take, uh, can you show these kind of videos? You have an example here on the top uh, right uh, of uh, children playing with each other on the sand tray. And then uh, you have the kinematic, the open pose uh, version of it. Uh, to the right of it, do people generally, uh, are they capable of recognizing what's happening, even if they only see uh, the um, kinematic information, uh, and uh, do they agree with each other on what's happening? That's basically what uh, Maddie Bartlett here did uh, in this paper. So lots of participants, it was an online study. Uh, it's just a simple uh, questionnaire study, so show them a bunch of videos in various uh, conditions. They either see the full scene or they just see uh, the video, and then ask them a bunch of questions like at scale, like to what degree do you agree um, with those things, like the child on the left was sad, the child on the right was sad, uh, the child was aggressive, the child was excited, a bunch of those things. That's all there is to it. Um, there are also a bunch of questions there just to catch the people who are not going to actually try uh, to do your experiment. So you can ask people, uh, were the people in the video children or adults? Uh, and you ask, and the answers are strongly agree, disagree, children, not sure, adults strongly agree. So people who always just click strongly disagree, those you can filter out immediately because they clearly didn't read uh, the uh, uh, the instructions. But what, what, what we had left were, I think, like 130 or even more people after that. 
Okay, so first thing you can do is ask how much do people agree uh, with each other, uh, two insights that fall out of it. They agree with each other more if they see the full scene uh, than if they see uh, just the kinematics. Um, they don't agree with each other a lot though. So if you look at these Krippendorf Alpha uh, scores, they're really not super high, right? So they're just like the highest thing we have for a clip is potentially 0 0.4 or something, yeah which isn't really great, right? It's not really up to the 0 0.8 or 0 0.9 that you see in like fantastic conditions, but at least it is above chance. So at least humans can pick up uh, on something. Uh, they don't necessarily agree uh, on what it is uh, that they're really seeing, but it is uh, the agreement um, is uh, better than chance. And it is higher if you have the full scene uh, than just the kinematics. But even for the kinematics, uh, it is higher than chance. So at least there is some hope that we can build a machine that can eventually pick up on these things, uh, because uh, at least humans seem to be picking up on something there. Hopefully we can, uh, you know, exploit that a little bit. You can do an exploratory uh, factor analysis to see what is it really that people pick up on. And they basically pick up on imbalance between the two children. They pick up on the valence of the interaction and they pick up on how engaged um, children are in the tasks. So those become like really interesting targets to see if you can recognize them uh, with an algorithm itself. Um, you can see how good it is, uh, how good machine learning algorithms would be at uh, predicting how humans would classify a certain scene. So in this case, the, uh, the classifier is fat, uh, the video scene, and then we ask it to predict what it thinks the human ratings were. Scales, and again, it works, but really not great. And all of that uh, is just the take home message here is just humans have considerable variability uh, in how they interpret even the same scene. Right, so that's why I said at the beginning, right, if you're in user experience design uh, and so on, I think this will all be uh, straightforward to you because every human is different and they interact with things that you design uh, differently. Uh, but if you have, um, uh, if you have um, like a machine learning approach and you think all humans are essentially going to be the same, uh, I'm trying to say that they are not uh, going to be the same. Uh, Simeon has to leave, so uh, by Simeon, I mean, the talk will be recorded, I guess, so it will just be available for uh, everybody else, uh, even the parts that you haven't yet seen. Uh, okay, how am I doing on time? So I have like three minutes left. I'll pick up the pace a little bit. So that the first thing here is humans are different, uh, but they do still like agree on some level, right? It's not like there was complete disagreement between all our raters, and even a KNN could pick up on the fact that there was something uh, that people tended to agree on here, just not very good. So at least it sort of scopes like what we expect uh, in performance from the algorithms that we build. We certainly cannot expect 100% agreement with a certain ground truth if humans will not show us 100% agreement. Right. So with that in mind, we can then ask, can we essentially build uh, algorithms that can explicitly recognize this kind of engagement, taking everything into account uh, that I just said and doing it in Pinsero. So first thing you can do again is ask people uh, to rate uh, how much they think uh, various uh, uh, clips uh, are engaged, uh, uh, show um, engagement. And the way we did that here is that uh, the um, Pinsero dataset comes with some um, annotation. Um, and uh, we asked basically uh, people to rate um, engagement in the three different annotations that uh, the data set came with. So there is a goal oriented aimless play. Um, there is, uh, sorry, um, there's a goal oriented play. So if the children are certainly doing something purposeful, there is aimless play when they seem to be playing, but without any clear goal. And there is a no play uh, condition where they don't seem to do anything at all. And it makes sense that you would expect uh, goal oriented things to be more and uh, to feature more engagement than aimless uh, behavior. And that should still be more engaging than no play. Uh, behavior. So we asked people uh, how much they would rate engagement, and this is sort of uh, on the right here with these uh, plots. Uh, and you can see that it's difficult to distinguish 
Those two especially goal-oriented and aimless play are difficult to distinguish between their uh, engagement ratings. It's certainly true that goal-oriented gets a little bit fatter uh, on high ratings and a bit narrower on low ratings. Uh, and if you do the statistics, yes, you can find a difference, but it's certainly not the case that uh, humans tend to agree a lot there. They also agree a little bit uh, in overall that the no play conditions show less engagement but again not in like the beautiful clear-cut way that you would hope for right where everything clusters around the six for goal oriented clips everything clusters around the three for aimless play and everything clusters around zero for no play that that just doesn't happen right and that should adjust a little bit our expectations of what we expect uh, from a realistic algorithm working on ecologically valid uh, situation um, scenarios um, it's possible to train algorithms that do um, that then try to classify this engagement. So um, we did this with conceptors. This is a type of reservoir computing, and then we get fantastic performance on training sets and slightly better than chance uh, performance on uh, testing sets. Uh, and we also tried something new that's called a Legendre memory unit. This is something I'm not going to talk about too much because that paper is currently still submitted. Uh, and then we got uh, much better results. Uh, and in particular, we can also use these LMUs um, to kind of do perform somewhat reasonably on classes that were not explicitly trained uh, in the training set. So the idea being that you can train on examples of high engagement and examples of low engagement. Uh, and if you then see an example of intermediate engagement that you haven't seen before, it's a little bit easier for our Legendre memory unit system to interpolate between the two extremes that it has been trained on and understand that this is a uh, this new example is something in between uh, than it is uh, in other types of classifiers. But the principle uh, is just what reservoir computing uh, will give you. If you have reservoirs that work well on two extrema, it should be possible to also identify um, things that sort of semantically land uh, between two extrema. And it should be possible to do this with like a um, reservoir type computing, like a conceptor network in particular as well. It's just we that uh, to work as well as we wanted to, which is why we switched to these Legendre memory units. If you haven't heard of them, there is a Europe's, Europe's paper last year uh, by Aaron Folke and uh, colleagues, which describes this. It's basically a kind of recurrent memory, uh, which tends to make optimal use of the reservoir. So if you're familiar with uh, reservoir computations, then you know that tuning the reservoir and the parameters is a bit of a black magic, a sort of dark art. How do I find uh, the best um, the best uh, values uh, for making this uh, reservoir work as well as I can? And Legendre memory units give you a mathematical answer uh, to how these uh, connections should be built. All right. How much time do I still have then? Just to say. We should because wrap up. Sorry, I can wrap up. Okay. Yeah, because we, we, yes, mm. we are running out of time. Okay. So, yes, we okay. run out of time. Okay, I'm going to wrap up, right? So, the same thing, forward models, this idea that we can predict the outcomes of actions, this is relevant for autonomous driving. So, I'm just going to leave this as a plug uh, for this uh, project. But what we did, is we built a controller for a robot vehicle that uh, is a little bit more inspired by how uh, the human mind works, in particular in terms of action selection uh, and so on. How does the system decide what to do? How does it run hypothetical situations so that you don't actually have to crash the vehicle in order to find out that a certain behavior uh, is a bad idea? Uh, so we did that in a bio-inspired way, right? You look at how the human brain uh, does this, and then you try to implement that in a controller. Um, it's also that you possible to use this kind of predictive mechanisms that you build in order to predict what other agents are doing. Um, but you can only do that really well for other um, vehicles because they have the same sort of dynamics. If you try to predict what a uh, uh, pedestrian is doing, then that gets, uh, that gets a little bit harder. So that's sort of my open uh, research question uh, on this part. Uh, it's very easy to build biologically in, uh, in inspired control for an autonomous vehicle because an advantage is it operates in two dimensions, so that's fantastic. Um, but using it to predict what uh, vulnerable road users are going to do uh, and so on, that is much harder, but that is, of course, what the field uh, still needs to solve. 
So I can see uh, Maria Lucy getting a bit impatient. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to zoom through the last point so people have opinions. Uh, I just want to say this, right? So a bunch of the work that we have done is building robots or introducing robots in care homes uh, so they can work like companion robots uh, for the elderly. Uh, and there are an interesting thing if you're in that field is that you have a lot of papers about researchers having strong opinions on what this robot should look like. Uh, and if you then go and talk to the people in the care homes, uh, they have very different opinions of how they should look like. So what we did here uh, is simply ask a bunch of robotics researchers, like what kind of robots do you think are appropriate and why are they appropriate for a kind of companion robot scenario. And then we asked a bunch of elderly in care homes what kind of robots they would want as well. And we also asked a lot of other stakeholders, right? We asked uh, people uh, who are uh, well, nurses in care homes. We asked family members, uh, everybody. And the interesting thing is that roboticists really like Paro and none of our elderly people liked Paro. Uh, the reason robot roboticists like Paro is because it's animal-like but it's not, so it's familiar, but it's not too familiar. So people will not get confused uh, as thinking that this would actually be uh, a seal. The reason the elderly didn't like Paro is because they don't know how to interact with a seal. They like a cat. They like a robot cat because they know how to interact with a robot cat. They know uh, it reminds them of Mr. Scruffles uh, that they had 20 years ago. Uh, it's just more familiar and that's okay. And I think that's the last, last point I want to make here, right? Because it's very easy to go off and build beautiful solutions to problems that you think make perfect sense. And then when you deploy it with your end users, uh, it fails fantastically as a product because you never actually talked to them. Uh, and you designed a solution that they were not asking for. Uh, so this kind of importance of always talking to the end users of your products, no matter if it's a robot, an algorithm or whatever, uh, this is sort of highlighted in the paper that I have. Yeah, I just have the reference down there and that's the take home message here. And since there is at least one philosopher, I want to point out that the same thing is true for ethical concerns. Philosophers have a lot of opinions on what ethical concerns of robots are, and stakeholders have a lot of uh, opinions on what ethical concerns are, and they do not match uh, between the literature and what and philosophical and users don't agree with what uh, the ethical problem. Okay, so I've got to stop there. So I, you see, I didn't actually get to talking to about XAI, but I got through most everything else. These are the PhD students who did a lot of the work that I mentioned. Uh, and so I just want to thank them. And I want to thank you for listening. Thank you. Right. Thank I think you. It, it was great. It, and it's a pity that people uh, have to leave because yeah, yeah usually this is one hour uh, meeting. Uh, let's see if some questions will come up in the short time we have left. But in the uh, in the meantime, I really would like, like, can you paste the title of the last paper you discussed? Uh, the title of the last paper. Me, person. Yeah, uh, the one with elderly. Oh, uh, these are so two Dr. different this, ones. The one about, this, this is one? different from the next one? Yeah, there are two yeah, different yeah. papers. Uh, so this one yeah. is basically, I think, on the importance of end user centered design, uh, I think yeah. uh, this one is basically ethical perception of stakeholders. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I can also um, look at the Yes, uh, you can look at that. If you Google Hannah yeah. Bradford's uh, Google Scholar profile, you will find them. Um, they are there. This is her most cited paper. Hmm? Yeah. And also the next one. Yeah, I will have Sorry. a look. Uh, Mike? Yes. Bye. Very goodbye. I want to say goodbye. I have to. Oh, okay. <laughs> goodbye. Thank you. Thanks for the. If anybody has questions, of course, I, I put my email address here, so you can also just uh, okay. uh, email me. I know we're running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. I will hang around for a little bit more, but I just have to go one second and let a cat out of this room. You know, <laughs> <laughs> always cats. Yeah. So there we go. Sorry. That's like yeah, no problem. It was really it was really cool. Um, of course, many aspects to 
to look at. Um, yeah, for me, what was interesting is that at one point you 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 put you wrote like a uh, we should not define all the behaviors of an yeah. agent, but uh, but still we want to constrain them, no? And I think yes. the the following slides about the neural neural networks were about that, right? But the thing is that when I when it gets to that complexity, I don't understand it. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. I think. Uh, <laughs> it's a very fair point to make because it's very easy uh, to uh, to mention this conceptually, right? That I don't want robots to do whatever. I want their behavior to be constrained, but at the yeah. same time, I cannot constrain. Uh, I cannot define everything a priori, but I still want uh, to constrain it. Yeah. So this is already uh, difficult to really uh, disentangle if you want to build uh, the system. And then if you want to have a system that actually behaves uh, within those uh, constraints, uh, that gets even harder. So that's yeah. obviously you figured out why we didn't actually build this right yeah. it's a conceptually i think it makes a lot of sense but how to really do it uh, is hard and uh, maybe it's a bit of a concern uh, that in a lot of modern day ai we don't actually seem to care about this part right we just throw a lot of data at an algorithm and que sera, sera, no? it's, uh, yeah. we don't think yeah, that yeah, I was actually interested in this point because we are, as a group, well, by the way, I will jump uh, out soon because the others <laughs> left because we have another meeting. But in okay. any case, we are writing a paper uh, and one of the points we are making is that uh, like um, the agent should be uh, constrained within uh, uh, the boundaries of morally acceptable situations or yes. uh, now to make it simple. Yeah, but actually then making this something actionable is all another story. Like you can say that indeed you were saying, but actually making it, 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 it it's yeah, really, really hard. something complex. Yeah. And it's yeah. also hard because uh, this, like this concept like morally acceptable is really fluffy. Uh, and even yeah. if you build something that you think is morally acceptable, right, you're just building your own morals in there uh, and it's going to bias the system towards your own morals and yeah. uh, how to. Yeah. Yeah, 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 indeed, indeed. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. 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 So thank oh, you very okay. much again. I'm so sorry that uh, I have to run into that other meeting. I thought it was at 30, but yeah, Evgeny, I think is also leaving for that. I uh, but I hope to see you soon, maybe at HRI or other venues. Exactly. Oh, you know, maybe in real life, it's not that far. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> It's well, just, let me know if you if you come into that for any reason. Yes, exactly. I will definitely be in touch. And also, if anybody comes to Nijmegen, and you know, you have my email address, just drop me a mail. Yeah. And we, you know, especially after Corona has gone away, maybe we can actually meet up in person, right? Would be yes. really nice. <laughs> yeah, that would be really nice. Mm. Let's hope. All right. Yeah. All right. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for joining. Yeah. See you. No problem. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.